Um, welcome, everyone. I mean, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Willems, um, lecturing, unfortunately, virtually at the ASC. We would, and we hope one day we will uh, host him in person. And we usually ask speakers to deliver or give us some sort of bio that they have. And uh, Brian sent a very short one, which reads, you know, Brian Willems is assistant professor at the University of Split, Croatia, where he teaches literature at the Faculty of Philosophy and Film Theory at the Arts Academy. He's the author of Hopkins and Heidegger and Facticity, Poverty and Clothes on Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go, which reads very nicely, but of course it does not even begin to express or reflect the breadth of interest of uh, Professor Williams, um, who is in many ways one of the more interesting uh, researchers and scholars of his generation, I think. His very eclectic um, interests include cultural history, film studies, science fiction studies, contemporary philosophy, all of which he does not do alternately, but together. And you can see that in the number of titles that he did not mention, I don't know why, in his um, short bio. So a really interesting moon about the cultural history of, of the moon and the moon race, shooting the moon that came out on Zero Books in 2015. Then a really brilliant book, uh, Speculative Realism in Science Fiction, was it Edinburgh? I think it was Edinburgh in 2017 and literally just out, like literally two weeks ago. And I think today's talk is partly sourced from that. The book on Rutledge uh, titled Sham Ruins, A User's Guide. So even, and that is a selection he has also published widely in journals, including science fiction studies um on Goddard and science fiction which may seem or speculative thinking which may seem a very unlikely uh, combination but you would have to read that great article so um it is really my great pleasure uh to welcome uh Professor Williams at the American Studies Center and the floor is yours Brian Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was a very kind introduction. I just want to double check that we were recording that so I can play it again to, to myself. That was the nicest introduction uh, I've ever had. So that's um, very, very kind. Uh, hello, everybody. That's amazing. So many people um, have uh, shown up for this. I really appreciate that and appreciate your time. And of course, um, I appreciate uh, being invited here and to everyone that organized this into the uh, American Studies Center, University of Warsaw. It's all it's really kind. I'm really happy to be here, um, even in this kind of virtual uh, virtual form. Um, yeah, so um, Pavel pretty much uh, said everything. Uh, I was uh, talking to uh, the organizers a bit before uh, the presentation, and I was telling them that I had been to Warsaw in 1996 for about I was there for about two weeks, um, visiting a friend and. Uh, I, I loved it. I don't know. I remember a lot of concrete, and I like that uh, here. Um, uh, I went to, <clears throat> I used to live in Prague for about seven years before living in Croatia, and at that time I went to uh, Krakow, I don't know, three or four times with friends, but I didn't like it uh, compared to Warsaw, so that's my personal uh, opinion um, here. But uh, I met Pavel at a conference in Sosnovets and things, and so I enjoy uh, quite a bit uh, your country. So it's nice to be there in some virtual form. Um, so but thank you. Uh, so let me just, I have a small presentation. This talk will be around 35 minutes or something um, uh, here. So let me just try to uh, share my screen because I'm uh, terrible at it in general. So just give me a second here. All right. So just as uh, you mentioned, hopefully you can see the screen. If you can't, then please just let me know. Um, so uh, this talk is based in part on this um, book that's just come out, this idea of sham ruins. Um, and I've kind of pulled together a number of aspects of it um, that relate to American studies in particular, So um, and, and added a few things uh, to it. So that's um, going to be the, the sort of focus. Um, however, sham ruins, they're a piece of architecture, I'll explain it in a moment, became popularized in England. So the first part of the talk is going to be kind of non-American, but it's going to just sort of set up the argument and then uh, I'll move into some uh, American examples. 
here. So, uh, so uh, let me just. Yeah. So, in 18th century England, a new craze swept the fancy gardens of the rich and bored, building fake Gothic ruins in order to enhance the look and feel of their estates. These were towers which crumbled on their very first day, walls which were never meant to reach their full height, and staircases that led to nowhere. Made of stone, plaster, and sometimes even canvas, such sham ruins were never taken seriously and caused the ire of many. Yet I attempt to take these merely decorative features and see how their playfulness can actually show how objects function in an unintended ways, at times even showing how objects that were taken to be fully functional were really shams all along. One of the key questions I want to raise is, what do sham ruins actually ruin? They are not real ruins. Real ruins are ruins of an actual object. If you go visit the, rules, the ruins of Pompeii, this is because you want to see the debris of something real that existed in a different form before 79 AD and that was ruined after. Sham ruins are different. There is nothing real behind them in time. Sham ruins are not ruins of something that was, but rather of something that was not. Sham ruins are about representing what is unrepresented. They are about creating new meaning where such meaning does not and should not exist. Sham ruins are jokes, games, decorations, and embarrassments. And this is what gives them the force with which, with which we can think about objects and new, in new and unintended ways. Through all of the examples that follow, and many more, sham ruins, one of the most useless of architectural features, are given in a rather joking manner, a user's guide. Yet there is a serious side to this argument also, since in an age when the function of the objects around us is already streamlined under the guise of user friendliness, almost any strategy for making our own way in the world should be welcome. The person at the helm of this art of the fake was gentleman architect Sanderson Miller. In the mid 1740s, he started building the sham ruin that solidified the craze at his family estate, Radway Grange at Edgehill. It includes an octagonal tower with windows too big to deflect enemy arrows and crumbling walls so weak they could only help defend against the most tepid of foes. Now it's a pub called the Castle Inn and it has its own Facebook page. Miller's sham was supposed to be appreciated more than used. As such, it is a prime example of Gothic revival architecture. As art historian Kenneth Clark says of the period, the Gothic revival aimed to stimulate the imagination and nothing more. At the same time, such sham, sham structures were not to everyone's liking. John Ruskin's take on the period was that, quote, I know nothing in the shape of error so dark as this, no imbecility so absolute, no treachery so contemptible. But figuring out why Miller made what he did and what it was supposed to mean is not so straightforward. He built this structure on the spot that Charles I supposedly raised his standard and rallied his troops during the English Civil War. But the party Miller held for the official opening of the structure was on September 3rd, 1750, an anniversary of the death of Oliver Cromwell. These two dates indicate the difficulty in interpreting this sham ruin. Is it a tribute to Charles I, a Catholic sympathizer, or built in the honor of Cromwell, a radical Puritan who is one of the signatories of Charles I's death, death warrant? Are sham ruins just a pretty decoration, part of a picturesque landscape, or are they meant to illustrate how the original Gothic buildings of a Catholic past were not strong enough to last? Are they merely pretty ornaments or political symbols built in support of the Jacobite rebellion of 1745? According to Laura Kaplan, it depends on which sham ruin you look at. Miller's first sham ruin at Edge Hill seems to lie somewhere between a purely aesthetic object and a political statement, a fact belied by the contradictory dates found at its inception and inauguration. Another construction of Miller's at Hagley Park is more clearly polemical. It was commissioned by patron of the arts, George uh, Littleton, 
to whom Henry Fielding's uh, Tom Jones is dedicated. Littleton was a well-known uh, critic of the original Gothic period. Thus he saw his ruins functioning as what David Stewart calls images of just destruction, meaning that ruined medieval towers were ways of showing how the dark ages of Catholicism were not strong enough to survive in the present ages of reason. What becomes apparent is that a fair amount of background knowledge is necessary in order to understand the context of this rather silly object. Kaplan foregrounds this by arguing that for 21st century viewers, sham ruins are simply exotic in the sense that they are not firmly ruined in the, rooted in the past because they're fake, but they're also not located in the present because the context of their production is generally lost to the average viewer. Thus, sham ruins become objects lost in time holding no real meaning except to generate a sense of wonder about what strange creatures they are. On the other hand, contemporary writers on sham ruins have sometimes subsumed them into thought on ruins in general. Thus, the way that real ruins confuse the clear separation of inside and outside, foreground processes of decay, engender a nostalgia for the past, or contrast the sterile present with a feral history are considered equally applicable to the fake ruins that mock them. However, in order to make the separation between sham ruins and real ones a bit clearer, a simple question can be asked. What is it that sham ruins ruin? In other words, if real ruins are ruins of what they actually are, meaning a similar example that the ruins of the Acropolis are a real ruined Acropolis, then perhaps sham ruins should be considered ruins of what they are not. It is this fundamental insight which will inform much of the thought in this talk. Sham ruins are about representing what is unrepresented. They're about imposing new meaning where such meaning does not and should not exist. Real ruins represent the decay of real objects. The decay of sham ruins is fake, at least when they're first constructed. Sham ruins are lies, ruses, and embarrassments. And this is what gives them their power as objects with which to think about using more contemporary things in new and unintended ways. For example, and here we get away from the England part of the talk. So for example, on June 11th, 1986, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette published an article called Fashioned Trend Full of Holes by Peter Leo. It was on an up and coming fad, buying a new pair of jeans with pre-ripped holes. In the article, Leo is surprised to find a new product that is sold already ruined. Quote, the holes will be put in at the faculty, he says. Citing the pre-planned ob obsolescence of cars and the holes in Swiss cheese as tongue-in-cheek predecessors, the writer then posits starting his own line of sham ruins, including, quote, pre-scratched stereo records, pre-worn dock ciders, and pre-eaten houseplants already ravaged by bugs. Although Leo focuses on explaining the style as a marketing gimmick, he also provides an early indication of an interest in objects bought already broken. The first iPhone came out on June 29, 2007. On a website dated exactly one month later, professional magician and science fiction writer Andrew Main already listed numerous apps to make your new phone look ruined. Damaged beyond all repair, missing icons, frozen screen, hole in screen, and the simply titled broken. These apps are listed as screen pranks, and the aim seems to be to load them on the phones of other people in order to make them think their apparatus has gone kaput. Not many may be fooled by such a trick today, yet scrap crap screen apps are still around. This is one of the things that makes such apps contemporary sham ruins. Pleasure in a broken object does not diminish when this brokenness is fake and purchased online. In another example, between 1972 and 1984, the sculpture in the Environment Group designed a number of best superstores across America that all looked like they were falling apart on the day they opened. They were designed by James Wines, who saw himself align more with the environmental art, with more with environmental art than postmodernism. Yet in order to describe the purposely unfinished appearance of these buildings, Wines coined the concept of the indeterminate facade. Once these different objects are all gathered together under the common term of sham ruins, the truth that they all ruin becomes apparent. 
One thing that contemporary shamblings seem to be doing is attacking user friendliness. Although there are huge open source and DIY communities out there, most of the objects we used are closed off behind single buttons and warranty invalidating contract agreements. Breaking these objects is a way of making them do things they are not meant to do, even if that new thing is simply not to work. Contemporary sham ruins are therefore political, not in the sense of critiquing a specific ideology, but by showing new uses for old objects. The way this is done is by breaking objects in different ways. In the uh, 1986 article on preverb genes, he complains that, hey, you don't get something for nothing, assuming you consider a whole something. Contemporary sham objects show that a whole is something. A whole can be a strategy for using objects in new and inventive ways. But let's back up for a minute. Another term for the sham ruin is a folly, mainly indicating how silly these objects usually are. Erasmus's text, The Praise of Folly from 1511, is generally taken as a joke worked out between the author and Thomas More, as a paradox praising stupidity in learned prose, and as a comedy about how the only way people can put up with each other is through the delusion of idiocy. The text is told through its narrator, Folly herself, who is addressing a group of gentlemen who have gathered to hear her wisdom, quote unquote. One of the first questions she asked them is how one can ever recognize folly just from its mere appearance. Still, what need was there to tell you this? This is folly speaking. As if in my very face in front, so to speak, I do not sufficiently announce who I am. As if anyone who was claiming that I am Minerva or the spirit of wisdom could not immediately be refuted by one good look. Even if I were not speaking, though speech is the least deceptive mirror of the mind, I have no use for cosmetics. I do not feign one thing in my face while I hold something else in my heart. I am in all points so like myself that even those who, who specially arrogate to themselves the part and name of wise men cannot conceal me. Though they walk about like apes in scarlet, or asses in lion skins. Folly argues that her foolish appearance is so obvious that it is strange that anyone could ever miss it. Someone who might mistake folly for wisdom need only take one good look at her very face in front to separate Minerva from an ass. Folly is so recognizable in part because she does not pretend to be anything else. She is in all points so like myself so that every effort to hide her, even by those pretending to be the wisest, can be successful. Yet in a satirical work such as Erasmus's, folly should be read as saying the opposite, actually. Folly is at times indistinguishable from wisdom, either because it is so well hidden by those who want to be taken as wise, or because it has no obvious markers. Hence the need for Erasmus's text. Elaborating many different kinds of folly, which might not seem obvious to the reader at first, but which become visible through the medium of satire. I would now like to focus on an example of another sham ruins of sorts, and one which is purposely created to be a replication of its original. Although this example is from the world of art rather than architecture, literature, or film. The American artist Sturtevant took the work of mainly male artists and even using some of the materials and equipment at times, made replications that, for all intents and purposes, were the same as the originals, except that they were by Sturtevant and not Warhol or Lichtenstein. These copies are not forgeries since they do not pretend to be the originals, and they expressly do not function as the originals, and that is their point. There are a number of reasons not to include this artist in a discussion of sham ruins. A sham ruin is a trick, a ruse, a con, and this artist's work is none of these. Even though her art often looks very similar to the original, there is no pretension to pretend, and it is anything other than it is, a replication of someone else's work of art by the artist Sturtevant. Therefore, a piece by Warhol called Warhol called Flowers is called Warhol's Flowers, 
in the artist's hands. The artist's work does not pretend to be Warhol's work. If it did, it would lose all of its meaning. Yet there are important connections between Sturtevant and the way sham ruins are being used in this talk. Most of her work looks like an original work by another artist, and yet it is not. Just as sham ruins look like real ruins, and yet they are not. More importantly, Sturtevant's work functions like sham ruins function. Real ruins are not sham ruins because real ruins were built as actual, valid, useful structures that decayed over time. Real ruins do not start out as ruins. They start out as something else. And external forces, whether natural or human-made, turn this something else into a ruin. Sham ruins are different. They are ruins from the start. So that even if over time they turn into real ones, the original that is ruined is still a fake although admittedly an original fake. Yet something else gets ruined with sham ruins. And if it's not the original that gets ruined, then what is it? Sturtevant's work offers a clue. Seeing her art as ruining the original she replicates is a mistake. If she really wanted to ruin Warhol's fl original flowers, she could have made exact copies of the work, and she actually could have because she had access to Warhol's original silk screens, and then she could have tried to mix her copies in with the originals, thus devaluing the original status of Warhol's work. And this is kind of similar to actually what Warhol did with his own artistic strategy. But she does not do that. She does not aim to ruin the original work. Her goal is something much more important than that because she casts a much wider net. Therefore, one question can be what the sham ruins of Sturtevant ruin. Of course, these are not sham ruins in the architectural sense, but in an artistic one. Yet the answer to what they do ruin is hinted at by Erasmus's folly, who is in all points so like myself, yet easily confused with wisdom. The work of Sturtevant is also in all points so like itself that it immediately addresses that which it is not. Thus, as York Heiser says of her work, it plunges us right into the Bermuda Triangle of idea, method, and execution. To understand this, we should say that Sturtevant actually combines two types of what we could call sham ruin art. The first would be art that is obviously a sham, such as Yoko Ono's all white chessboard, which is meant to frustrate anyone's ability to play and thus make a statement for peace. Another kind of sham art, if we can call it that, would try to hide the fact that it is a sham. One example is of this is how, in the summer of 2009, the New York Times ran a story called The Ruins of the Gilded Age. The online version of the article featured a slideshow with a number of photographs of contemporary ruins, including abandoned fac fac uh, factories and ghost stunts. The article has since been taken down. This is because Edgar Martins, the photographer of the images featured, use Photoshop to make the images look more ruined than they actually did in real life. Sturtevant's work is both types of sham art at once. She makes replications of existing artworks that are extremely close to the originals. She shows, in her own words, the brutal truth of the work that is not a copy. For example, when making this flowers artwork based on Andy Warhol, she asked Warhol if she could use his original printing screens for it, and he agreed. This was done to make her work as indistinguishable as possible from the model, yet she never pretends that her work was that of the original artist. Her work is called Warhol's Flowers, and she had no intent to plagiarize the artist's work or pass it off as her own. The reason for her work was found elsewhere. Using the concept of sham ruins, Hopefully this elsewhere can come into focus. In an essay originally presented at one of the Tate Modern uh, Saturday Live events in 2009, Sturtevant discusses some of the key concepts and approaches of her work. This essay, this talk is called Modes of Thought and it, quick, and it quickly features a phrase that is paramount for understanding just how her work can be considered under the rubric of sham ruins. After stating how, Repetition is displaced difference, and repetition is pushing the limits of resemblance. The artist says that 
understanding is not the role of knowledge. Rather, knowledge is made for cutting. And this indeed is my, present, is my premise. What is the cut that Sturtevant mentions in this quote when her work functions as a mode of replication? No matter whether or not one can differentiate her work from the original, the cut does not lie in the quality of her images. Rather, the cut is to be found in the difference between Warhol as creator and Sir Tevant as creator. And since many of her images were made before the original artist became famous, this cut is not just about a more famous and less famous artist making the same work. And this cut is not just about, is not just made along the lines of sex, although Sturtevant has mainly made copies of male artists' work. And so the knowledge that is made for cutting could be argued to be a knowledge of the sex of the artist and the assumed reception such an artist could expect in distinction to a reception a woman of the same talent and creating the same work could look forward to, a kind of Shakespeare's sister of the art world. This indicates that Sturtevant does not take aim at any single aspect of an artwork or artist. Rather, she is interested in questioning everything involved in the artwork including issues of production, reception, exhibition, and archiving. I have no place at all in relation, I have no place at all except in relation to the total structure, she said. What interests me is not communicating, but creating change. And this total change can be disturbing. In the words of Anne Dresden, Sturtevant is intransigent, wily, cannibalistic. She annoys as much as she ravishes in every sense of the word. Far from being a matter of distance, elusive quotation, her entire practice is more suggestive of performance. This is a description not only of Sturtevant's work, but also of sham ruins at their best. Intransigent and cannibalistic, ravishing and annoying. The question then becomes how such replications become so powerful. Part of the reason is that they redefine the notion of what an object can do. Sturtevant creates an artwork in order to attack its total structure. This means that she is not attacking any particular aspect of the work, but the underlying foundation which allows this work to be created, exhibited, and read in the way that it is. In this sense, she takes an artwork that functioned in one way and shows that it actually works in another way. Assumed notions of reputation and reception are seen to be located in distinct notions of sex, status, and class. In order to do this, the artist does not ruin the original work, but rather shows how the original work was a ruin all along. In other words, it is the original work that is secretly a sham. It just takes through Devant to expose it. A similar strategy can be found in a number of film examples, which will be used to close this talk. In Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation from 1974, Harry Call, who is played by Gene Hackman, is a private surveillance expert. At the end of the film, his client's assistant calls him to say that he no longer needs him to look into the case. In fact, the assistant insists on, on Saul dropping the whole matter, saying that we'll be listening to you as an open threat. This drives Cole, who makes his living from eavesdropping, tear down his apartment in order to find any listening devices his client may have planted. So the Gene Hackman character here rips up floorboards and digs into the walls until his home turns into a demolition zone. Then at the end, he picks up his saxophone to play, seemingly resigned to having to live the rest of his life in what Shoshana Zuboff much later called the age of surveillance capitalism. Yet watching this scene in the context of sham ruins, we can see that what Hackman actually does is merely turn his home into what it already always was, an unsecured place that could have always been tapped, just as he was doing to others. In other words, his destruction of his home merely turns his home into what it already was, a ruin, but not a real ruin, 
a sham ruin. His home would be a real ruin if it had functioned at one time as a home and then was turned into something else. Instead, from the beginning, this space was open to the surveillance of others, as all homes are. From the start, his home was not really the safe place he thought it was. The destruction he causes merely foregrounds the state his home had always occupied. It was never what he thought it was, just like the homes of those he taps into only functions as covers for his illicit surveillance. Yet just as the function of sham ruins differ from one another, the destruction of homes in films does not always have the same role. In one non-American example, uh, Haneke's first uh, feature film, The Seventh Continent from 1989, uh, in this film, uh, an Austrian middle-class family is shown going through various aspects of their mundane lives. Then after a visit to their grandparents, the father decides that the family is going to leave presumably to the seventh continent of the film's title, meaning Australia. However, what happens instead is that the family methodically destroys their own home, flushing their money down the toilet and smashing their fish tank, only to have the father kill each of them as well as himself in the end. The destruction of home in the conversation was related so that in the Coppola's film, the previous film I talked about, the destruction of home in that film was related to the porousness of walls that are otherwise taken as solid. Walls do not start their lives as solid barriers to the outside world and then degrade into ruins full of holes through which the world is listening. Rather, in Coppola's film, the destruction of home merely shows the way that all homes are already built in the style of easy listening. The family in the seventh continent, so this film, Hanukkah's film, destroys their home with a different purpose in mind. In no way is this a film about surveillance that would be reserved for the filmmaker's later film, Caché, 2005. Instead, the destruction of this home is about family and family institutions and family norms and family disappointments. In other words, the home in this film is also a sham ruin, but of a different kind. From the beginning of the film, when the family is shown just going about their everyday activities of eating breakfast and so on, the home is already dysfunctional, enclosing the family within forced, cold, emotionalist situations. Thus, when D.I. Grossvogel argues that in this film, quote, Hanukkah set out to show how the daily repetitions of a trivialized existence lead ultimately to the rage that causes its victims to destroy their material possessions and ultimately themselves, a beat is missed in that it's not the daily repetitions of trivialized existence that lead to rage, but rather another force which lies behind these repetitions. Thus the house in this film is not just a house but rather an instigator of family obligations, expectations, mortgages, and the pressure to keep jobs that one does not love. The house is already a sham even before it is destroyed because it never does the work that it is supposed to do. It does not bring the family together, it tears them apart. Thus taking the home apart piece by piece merely exposes the domestic structure for what it was, a sham. And yet another kind of house destruction is involved in Jean-Marc Vallée's film Demolition from 2015. So in this film, one night, uh, the main character Davis, who's played by Jake Gyllenhaal, and his wife Julia, played by Heather Lind, are driving home and they're hit by another car and Julia dies. After recovering from his injuries, Davis realized, realizes that he never actually loved his wife. Then later, Davis learns that his wife was unfaithful to him and had become pregnant with another man's child. David responds to all of this with very little emotion. However, as the title of the film indicates, he begins to demolish from the inside the expensive modern home that they shared together, first attacking the kitchen appliances and then his computer. Finally, Davis gets a bulldozer and with the help of a friend, levels the whole house to the ground. The demolition in this film takes on a much more personal nature than found in either The Conversation or The Seventh Continent. Yet, Davis's demolition has a similar effect. 
Taking a puppy's home, first slowly, then quickly, merely shows the home for what it already was, a sham. This destruction does not turn a solid home into a ruin. Rather, it shows that the home was already a ruin, that it was already broken, just like his marriage from the start. And in that sense, even though it appears to be a fully functioning home, its function is that of a fake. It just takes its destruction to bring its true face into the light. So in conclusion, when we take the different home de deconstructions presented here together, we start to see a common denominator. In the conversation, uh, Gene Hackman was taking his apartment apart piece by piece to find any surveillance devices that were hidden. Hamike's family destroys their home just as their sense of family had already been destroyed. And in this last film, Davis's dismantling of his marriage is mirrored in the demolition of his home. And all films share a strategy of ruining an object in order to show that that object never really functioned the way it was intended. In other words, objects such as a home or even a painting are broken back to their original state of brokenness. Flashy veneers are gone, an object's true function is represented in its ruined appearance rather than being hidden behind a flashy facade. Thus, I can finish this talk by making a rather paradoxical claim that sham ruins are actually the real ruins, while it is real ruins that are fake. This is because sham ruins are ruins from the start, while real ruins do not start out as ruins but as something else and only gradually become ruins over time. So sham ruins are really all around us. We just need a bit of destruction to see them for what they really are. Thanks. That's it. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, now we have quite a lot of time for a Q&A. So if anyone would like to ask a question, I can already see uh, Marta. No, Marta is clapping, sorry. I, I thought it might have been the raised hand. Um, but if anyone is interested in asking a question, you can either use the raising hand function or ask a question in the chat box. Um, I might actually start uh, by saying this was, a, this was a wonderful talk and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I like the little references to the Gothic in the very beginning. I thought um, when you mentioned that, I thought before you mentioned that because <laughs> you were interested in that field. So I thought that was- Yeah, good. yeah. And um, I thought about Strawberry Hill and um, uh -huh. you know, how you know, you know, the, the very beginning of the Gothic literature mm -hmm. is, is already a sham in the sense. So mm -hmm. that was great. Um, I have a question which is very, I guess, naive, uh, but I, I just kind of have to get it out of my system. Um, do you, in your book or kind of in your research on, on, on Shamarins, um kind of connected in any way with what the art simulacrum, like the this 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 notion of you know a copy of a copy of a copy without the original? Is there some is there something there that might be? You know, interesting for you or not really, or are we talking about completely separate? Uh, no, de definitely. So this, this, thanks. That's a great, uh, great question. It's very kind. Um, yeah, this, yeah, with the simulacrum, this idea that you know you have an image that has no, you can't find that basis in reality anywhere. So this mani image has been manipulated so much. The classic example, of course, is you know the picture of a of a model on a fashion magazine cover, and it's been photoshopped so much that that person you cannot find anywhere in real life anymore, and that we're kind of surrounded um, by these uh, by these fake um, by these fake images. Uh, I think in that sense, there's a there's a, a connection um, here. However, I think that um, the difference, perhaps, with and and there's a connection that that both of these kinds of images are not meant to be political in some sense. They're just meant to be looked at and pretty, and you know, or to be picturesque or something um but then the question for me and i don't i didn't think about that so much is that you know can these simulacra can they be um are they interesting in the way that they show that original images of people you know that those are actually problematic in that sense that we pretend that that, that these non-simulacra images are uh, are the real ones in simulacra are the fake ones um, what I think is interesting about sham ruins is that they kind of show that that all objects are kind of sham ruins in that way. And I'm not sure if, if the if the simulacra functions in the same in the same way uh, in that sense. But again, I haven't I'm, I haven't read him for for quite quite a long time, so you would probably be much more um, 
Um, so I can ask you that. Is that is do you see in uh, with Bold GR, do you see that idea that um, that the simulacra will then can then be used as a way to read the kind of non simulacra images as being kind of fakes themselves in some way, or or does he not really go there? Um, um, well, thank you for your answer and, and um, kind of um, maybe uh, kind of springboarding on your question now. Um, I mm. think. I think this is, I mean, I think you're right that there is a certain kind of binary opposition that, um, you know, Baldiar sets up for us that is kind of difficult to get around, um, to get around. I mean, if, if, if what we are looking at are simulacra and then the non-simulacra are real or, and that's it, right? And this is where the argument mm. ends. And this is, this is kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of a tautology. I was thinking about one example of a, kind of a chamberin that might be, that might be connected for simulacrum, and this is this is Banksy uh, Banksy's installation of this kind of Disney um, Disneyland. I don't know if you if, if okay. you're familiar with that. This mm -hmm. is the one with the kind of you know. It was a whole um, thing you could visit, like a little park or something. Is that right? Kind yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Like images from from Disney princesses movies, but uh, kind of in a way that they are um, I don't know broken or gl glitchy or kind of you know unpleasant and in a sense ruined. I mean, this is a kind of um, a ruin of an amusement park, right? But based mm -hmm. on, uh, on Disney, which again was an example that the bodily art used in, in simulacra and simulation. So mm -hmm. I was thinking about this example that it might be something that connects those two concepts in a kind of new way perhaps. But I, you know, this is just something that kind of came to my head just a moment ago and um, probably, um, you know. Um, I would think more of maybe some, I mean, that definitely, but perhaps another good example would be like this exit through the gift shop, this Banksy film, mm -hmm. you know, where it was like, it's, it's a documentary and it's not, and you have this Terry, this, this French artist who becomes an important graffiti artist, but does he, is he just a fake of Banksy's? And when you watch that film, you can tell the way it's edited and things, it's not, there's like, the, this, it looks like continuous time and it's not, and it's cut together in kind of a way to like really let you know that you shouldn't kind of believe everything. But then you also have these real images of people doing illegal graffiti that are obviously not faked and this kind of mix, uh, this kind of mix in that sense. Um, and I like that. I, I think shamaroons are, I mean, are maybe close to that in the sense that they're real objects. I mean, they really exist in the world. They're there in mm -hmm. front of you, but the real objects that proclaim that they're not yeah. the real things in that way and so i think that film and i'm more familiar with that film than, than with um some of this other art that but that that film i think does a similar thing where it says um, you know this is real graffiti real things but at the same time don't trust what's going on there's there's mm -hmm. something else there's something else happening here which of course the disneyland would be a similar similar thing probably mm -hmm. thank you um we do have some questions in the in the chat so i will wait <laughs> okay. for the benefit of the recording um, so Alicia Kowalewska asks, some movie directors often need destroyed buildings that are built or destroyed for movie needs. Can we talk about Sean Ruin here? Okay, no, that's nice. I was thinking, yeah, this, this first image that I showed, this, this Eiffel Tower, I mean, it's obviously not the Eiffel Tower being destroyed. I was thinking, that's a really good question, uh, Alicia, thanks, that's, that's really nice. Um, uh, yeah, I was, I was thinking about that, this whole idea of kind of building these fake, you know, kind of fake things uh, for, movies I think about, wasn't it like Kevin Costner's Waterworld at the time was the most expensive film ever made because he built this big set and then it was destroyed and he had to build the set, you know, I don't know well, this kind of like uh, crazy things like this. Then the next step would be, what's that guy's name in, in is it in Russia, that Dow, those Dow films where he had, he, he made that, he had, he's just started releasing them and each film is like 50 hours long and he made people live together for three years in this kind of like abandoned factory, does anyone know what I'm talking about? D-A-U, I forget the filmmaker's name, but he, it's a whole, he built this whole kind of like fake world for, for actors to live in for years and film them uh, for fiction films or whatever. And, and it supposedly was quite traumatic for the actors and things like this to be a part of it um, here. So that would be say the next step in that for me, you know, would be building a whole like way of life <laughs> in a sense, a fake and everyone's in costumes, like a period piece and, and things, a lot of parts of it. Uh, uh, people in costume and things like this. And so that would be kind of interesting like this. But I think Alicia is asking a little different question. You can respond to this um, here, you know, where you're building things that are meant to be destroyed uh, here. I had a friend who was an architect in, um, in China and, and he said his speciality was making, um, can, making buildings for the workers who worked on construction sites. Like that was his thing. And it was all about that. It, it had to be kind of 
tough enough to last for you know six months, but then you had to be really easily destroyed and recycled and things. And so that was kind of a challenge to find this to find this balance. But I don't know. That, that's a good question. I don't know. I can't. I don't have any good examples of a director of how that would be a good question for like a set. Like how do you you know build this your question about how do you build a skyscraper that's meant to fall apart in, in that sense and to fall apart in a certain way so it doesn't hurt anybody and things like that and those could be sham ruins i think yeah that, that could, could, could could be that could be kind of interesting with that. not kind of interesting but it's good that's a good question with that okay so i think okay. i said uh, we can move on to susan nastapua what inspired you to study the subject of sham ruins any specific one well, thanks. That's, that's also a good question. Yeah, I was I was reading this. Kenneth Clark has a as a, a British art historian has this book on um, the Gothic revival, and uh, so I, I don't know. I'm not an art historian, but I was just reading it because it was fun or something. And then he he mentioned these things, and he was just you know they they sounded just so um, trashy kind of as a <laughs> as an object, and that attracted me. I, I like um, and it, you know that kind of. I like things that are kind of bad, considered bad, and trying to rethink them and and to and to um, and to see what kind of value they might they might have. But I just thought this idea of of things being made like purposely made not to work somehow was an interesting idea. When I explain this idea to people, that's kind of the hard. Like if people suggest different sham ruins, then that's kind of the hard thing. Like with this thing with Elita, I mean, in a sense, those buildings for films they're meant to work, but to work in a way that they fall apart or explode. So those things function uh, in, in a way, even though they are destroyed. And I was kind of interested in things that were purposely meant to not function, which is kind of a weird genre uh, in, in that way. And then I sort of got led to with these how, destructions of homes to looking at how uh, things actually kind of never function. And so these sham ruins kind of show how that, how that is. And this is connected to this, Bob will mention one book on speculative Realism is kind of connected to some of these kind of ideas, other philosophical ideas, but I didn't include them out for this for this talk. But that's the direction that some of that goes in. Okay, can I can I ask about speculative realism? Because actually, mm -hmm. that's something that interests me. So, okay. um, yeah, I know it's a big question, and people probably mm -hmm. don't want to have time for it, you know, to mm -hmm. for the answer. But I'm I'm just kind of curious as to the lines that connect the you know Shan rooms and uh, your work on speculative realism. Um, so maybe one kind of um, uh, quick way to, to talk about it. Uh, so one of the thinkers in this field, his name is Graham Harmon, um, who came up with this term, speculative realism. We don't need to go into what the real ideas of it are, um, but he has this idea of, of ruination, he calls it, which is um, basically the idea is how can we, uh, we as humans, how can we have access to the world outside of our thoughts and feelings? So how can we ever know that the world exists outside of touch and our senses and our thought and so on? Um, here. And so his one way that we could maybe do this is through this idea he calls ruination. So for example, if we tell a joke, um, if I say a joke and you don't get the joke, the worst thing I can do is to explain it. Like if I explain a joke, it'll never be funny. So by explaining a joke, I destroy the invisible funny bit inside the joke that you can't really explain. So by ruining a joke, I get a feeling about what in that joke was funny, but I never really talked about it. Like I didn't say, this is the funny part. I explained the joke, oh, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. And you say, okay, but now the whole thing's ruined. Well, what was ruined? The little funny bit here. So a way to have access to the funny bit of a joke is to ruin it. And then you kind of start thinking about, aha, so what did I ruin? Oh, that thing, that was the funny bit in some way. Um, here in this sense, sham ruins are also about ruining uh, here. And so if you ruin what, that's why I kept asking this kind of question of, you know, what do they, what do sham ruins ruin? Do they ruin the truth or time or I don't know what? Uh, there's a whole other thing too with sham ruins. So I started mentioning in the 18th century, but they, the, the first ones are quite much older than that. Uh, and the problem is if a sham ruin was made hundreds of years ago, now it's a real ruin and you can't distinguish it from other ruins. So they really started in Rome with some fake ruins and, and, and now we don't know exactly what's what. Uh, so in a sense, those sham ruins like ruin ideas of time, what's a sham and what's not, and, and, and truth and, and things like this. Um, so my basic question here is that uh, ruining something can make you ask the question, what was ruined? And that can kind of be an indirect way of thinking about the world outside of the 
um, experience that you have. So that's not a very clear explanation, but that's kind of a, trying to be a quick explanation. Oh, I, I love this explanation. I really like this idea of relation. And so, um, and I think it kind of uh, connects nicely with your talk. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, do we have some other questions uh, from our guest today? I mean, I know in, so you live in, in Warsaw, right? Which was, you know, reconstructed after the war. And, you know, isn't it, people when I was there tell me this is probably not true, but people there were telling me like the whole city is built on like three feet of rubble or something like that, that there, you know, I don't know if that's something, if that was just what some person lied mm -hmm. to me till I sound it's like a American or something. Yeah, so I heard something about that, that, you know, uh, like, like this, um, but there are parts of Warsaw that are preserved, is that right? Mm -hmm. Like an older, older part. Uh, like yeah, though probably not the ones that are shown to the tourists. Like so, when okay. people go to the old town, this is not actually the old town. This is the kind of reconstructed old town. In the, mm -hmm. in the okay, that reconstructed. So, yeah, what, what I was pointed out again. Tell me, uh, this is like my memory from 1996, and I'm probably going to be really offensive, and you all think I'm the worst. I should never mention this good worst. But was is there something like uh, the, again? Uh, sorry, correct me. So I guess I just want to be corrected here. Um, what I was told is something like you could walk down the street like in Warsaw and you would see all these new buildings and in the middle of all those new buildings there'd be one older one yeah. and that's where like the national socialists kind of lived while they just sort of like well you know like well like, is, that, is that kind of right or, or not is that possible yeah. or is yeah, that... you can still see that you can you have like those kind of older buildings that are I mean it's it's increasingly difficult to see them because they are being covered you know um with like additional I don't know heating whatever like thermal okay stuff right mm -hmm. in front of it but uh, but sometimes you can still notice the the difference in the shades shades of color or even in some very old buildings but this is this is disappearing very fast like even mm -hmm. bullet holes so i remember them from my, my my childhood but you know that's something that again is being covered okay. in a lot of places okay. and okay. thinking about ruins and um kind of you know um rumble i live next to a place where there is this kind of landmark called um, Kopitz Powstania, so like the hill of Warsaw Uprising. And it's, it's not a real hill, it, it, was, it, was, it was basically rubble, right? This is constructed out of, you know, earth and dirt and uh, uh, rubble after, after Warsaw Uprising and after the, the Second World War, they, when they just had to put it somewhere. There's like a big hill which is now overgrown with trees and it looks very natural mm -hmm. and very like on the side of the of nature, not in the science of culture, but of course this is this is not real. This has right. okay. been taken over by nature. It's, it's mm. very kind of overgrown and there's a lot of like um yeah like a like a bushes and whatever but but still this is something that was created out of um out of ruins basically. Okay. Okay. So that that to me something like that might be closer even maybe the like you said the, the part of Warsaw that's like the fake old town Mm -hmm. Yes, like this would be this kind of shape, you know, something that's made to look old, but is, you know, what is a recent construction and, and yeah. so on, so on, how that relates to what kind of existed. Before. But you know, so in, know. in some way, the sham ruins are not sham ruins because the, the bricks that they used to rebuild the old town in the 50s, well, first mm -hmm. of all, it's from the 50s, so right mm -hmm. now it is kind of old. Right, that's the thing, right, yeah. So, and yeah. then the bricks that they use, they really try to be authentic. So the bricks mm -hmm. that they use actually were traveled from Western uh, cities of the newly gained West of Poland. And mm -hmm. They were historically accurate. Okay. If you consider that the old town was reconstructed on the basis of paintings from mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. moment in time. So I think that it's a, in this case, when you're thinking of like what your sham ruins theory allows to do to like ontology of things, mm -hmm. right? It is like moves back and forth from being a sham ruin and not being a sham ruin. So, okay. so thank you for making us look at Guild Town in this completely new. No, but also, I mean, I, I know, I, I don't know what I'm talking about at all. So I'm just, uh, I, I, so please, you know, I, you know, I'm probably just being offensive, but I just, I don't know, I'm just trying no, to, no. Just um, and actually, I think I saw a raised hand from mm -hmm. Marta Lutko. Um, yeah, well, like we were talking about the old town. So I think it's a question, if someone gets, if something gets broken, and then it's got fixed that you can't say it was broken. So is it a shambling or is it not? Like okay, yeah. I mean, I think that the um, you know, like the basic premise of this is like everything is already broken in, in a sense, and we just kind of like pretend that it's not. So the what shamrins do is they kind of make this brokenness a bit more obvious. So 
when things function, we don't think about it. But then when some, you know, like the, this is again going back to the speculative realism and this Martin Heidegger. So Heidegger will say, if you use a hammer and it functions, you don't think about it. It's just a part of your world. But if a hammer doesn't function, if it's broken or cracked or something, I don't know what, then you start seeing it as what for what it is, as the object that it is in some way. Um, and all objects are already broken. We just don't use them in every way that's possible and doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't know what to be. Every object is already problematic um, here. And sham ruins kind of show that that's a bit problematic. So in, in answer to this question, I don't know, please, again, and uh, tell me if, if I'm wrong or you're, if you're probably thinking about this in a different way, so I'm sorry. But if we go back between, you know, something's broken and then fixed and kind of broken again, um, to me, that's kind of the actual way that all objects are and people are. And when I say object, I mean everything, like people, thoughts, ideas, uh, objects, animals, everything uh, like this, that they are. They're always kind of broken. And in a sense, this, this COVID pandemic has, has shown that. So before, like supermarkets were normal, you just go to buy food and whatever, and then they suddenly became death zones. Yes, because you did everything was weird and you didn't know what disease you could get from like a package of peas or something like this. So it suddenly everything was broken in that way. So what I mean by broken is it you, it didn't function in the world as we thought that it that it that it would. Um, and so sham ruins, I think, in a sense, when I say everything's ruined, everything's broken, I kind of mean that that everything is already kind of weird, but we just kind of live our lives in a normal way. Uh, we live our lives as if it's not. So. Perhaps in answer to your question is, I think if something gets it's like broken and fixed and broken and fixed, if that becomes clear, that process between those two, I think that that's a great example or, or something to maybe look at because I think it's making obvious what happens to most objects in, in the world. It just becomes clearer when those things kind of are more on the surface. Okay, well, I wanted to thank you one, uh, once again, um, uh, our esteemed speaker, Ryan Willems, for a wonderful talk. And uh, thank you all for coming today. And um, I wish you all a pleasant evening. And uh, I do hope that this thought about, you know, brokenness of the world will stay with you because this is a really uh, kind of interesting thought. And um, especially in our COVID times, it's, it's something to, uh, to look at in, in um, you know, more detail than perhaps before.